Hey guys, and um, welcome to the story about how I have this M4 and where it started, what happened, what I've done to it, who's helped me, and um, what the future plans are. So we'll take it back to last year when I sold an RB20 S13. I sold that because I wanted to build a turbo BMW. I bought all the parts and the rolling shell and everything to build an RB25 E46. And um, that was still the goal, that was always the goal. Um, one day I still dream of doing that, but um, realizing how much it's actually gonna cost to build one is uh, pretty crazy. So I, um, as I do, I scroll marketplace every now and then to just keep an eye on what's on the market. And um, this thing popped up, a 2017 M4. And when I saw the ad, which I post up now, I thought that it was too good to be true. I thought there's no way that that car's 15 grand. This is obviously a scam. Um, but yeah, I ended up looking uh, at the ad a bit more. I messaged the seller and just asked him if the car was in Perth, which it was. He said the car was in Balladur. And at the time I was in Malaga, so which is the next suburb over. I thought, are you home now? I wanna come and have a look. So at the time though, I had no money. I didn't have anything to buy it because I was already um, putting money into the RB25 E46 project, but um, curiosity's sake, thought I'd just go have a look at it because if it's worth it, I'll make it happen. I'll get something done. I'll make it work. So I, um, yeah, went around to his place. His dad was there and showed me the car, showed me that it ran, showed me that it drove, uh, even though it just moved it forward and back in his thing. But the pictures in the ad were misleading. It made it look like there was front end panels on it and it was pretty much complete. It wasn't, it was missing a whole heap of front end panels. And obviously knowing the car was stat right off, um, he did say that in the ad, I was like, perfect race car. Um, and I had to get in quick before Vultures come and picked it up for uh, for parts because I know that these things are sought after to part out. So for the price that I got it for, uh, the price, sorry, the price that he was asking for it, um, that's pretty much what the motor and gearbox were worth alone. So I thought, this is a great opportunity to build a cool race car. So this here being only $15,000 when I picked it up, I thought There's that this is just crazy. Like how much is it really gonna be to fix? And um, I did a few calculations on what parts are worth, um, but I didn't include everything. I thought if I can get all the parts to fix it for the 10 grand, then I'm in a better position than it would have been with the E46 because it's already running, it's already driving. So, dad gave me a hand, uh, helped me out, lent me some money to pick up the car to save it from the vultures picking it up and uh, parting it out. So, had a had a fun time loading it up onto the trailer with its broken wheel, and um, and yeah, broken rim, broken control arm. It uh, dragged itself up onto the trailer. So thank goodness I managed to get it on there. Um, got it home and it sunk into me like I've got a next level race car this is this is gonna be a cool project um, knowing that it would be difficult because none of the front end was on I didn't know how it went back together um, had to look at a lot of uh, exploded diagrams of how these things worked and what parts I needed so I've spent so much time finding parts what I'm missing what I required um, which included all the um, ducting for the radiators and all that so but the first job that I had to do when I got it home was to remove the wheel that was damaged and that was a whole um, saga in itself because I ended up stripping the lock nut key that was in the rim uh, that was that was for the lock nut uh, I managed to get the other three off but the one that was actually broken I couldn't actually get it off because the lock nut key was sliding around there like the flower type um, but I found a way to break the um, lock nut, uh, the lock nut bolt that was in the rim, um, and then weld a 17 mil hex nut from another uh, wheel nut onto it to then be able to pull it off. So three hours later, I finally managed to get the front wheel off and have a look at the damage that was under there. Uh, I was very lucky that it was just the lower control arm. There was no chassis damage. There was no subframe damage. Um, no suspension damage, it was straight as just the lower control arm. So super stoked that it was just that and the rim, obviously. So 
With factory BMW 666M rims, I know that they're worth a fair bit of money. I knew that I could sell them, but I need to fix the broken ones. So I got that fixed by Mobin Malaga and um, yeah, advertised them as fairly rough because they were fairly rough. Uh, sadly, the person didn't look after them or in the crash it managed to clip every single rim on a curb or something like that. Um, but they're all straight, so ended up selling them and then I was on the hunt to look for new rims. So looking around for 18 inch wheels, some that actually fit the tires that I require because I want to run an 18 inch tire. Um, they're cheaper, easier to get, way easier to get second hand. Um, I remember seeing D-Speed um, doing custom forged wheels. So I dropped Kieran a message at D-Speed and uh, asked him if if he has any um, yeah, if he still does them, and he does, and he did. He said um, he can do them, there is a way, which totally understandable. Uh, so I sent him basically a basic design of what I wanted, some measurements, uh, and yeah, pretty much instantly came back with an initial design um, with, yeah, of what the rim is, and it was pretty much perfect. I just wanted a bit more concave, so went to a bigger core and managed to get the exact design that I wanted in the color that I wanted, and um, yeah, size offset everything. So, custom made D speed wheels um, were on order. That was one of the first things that I ordered for the car. Um, and then, obviously, I had to buy control arm, radiators, uh, all the bumper supports, all the air um, that were all the air ducting, um, headlights, grills, bonnet, fenders. I even had to buy a side marker because the other side marker didn't exist when I got the car. So I was very lucky on eBay that they actually had one available. Uh, it was just that side that I needed. So perfect for that. Um, yes, yeah, so I ended up contacting BMW to get pricing on all the parts. Uh, contacted a few eBay sellers as well. Um, a lot of the stuff on eBay was pretty much the same price as BMW OEM, so I don't know where they've got all their pricing from. Uh, it was pretty crazy that they would, yeah, not be cheaper for second-hand parts. Um, the biggest thing that I needed to find was bonnet. Uh, bonnets here in Perth, pretty much non-existent. Um, bumpers, I managed to find this bumper in um, about a six out of 10 condition. Here for a quarter of the price of what a brand new one was. So I thought, it's a race car, I don't need the fancy, fancy one. I'll just get that one, so managed to get that at a good price. Um, and yeah, and then I needed a bonnet because the old bonnet was, yeah, bent. So looking online, there were secondhand bonnets in Sydney for about $1,700. But then I'd need to pay $500 freight to get it here. That was not gonna be very efficient, $2,200 for a factory bonnet when Seabon Carbon is just over $1,900 delivered to WA. So I thought it'd be silly not to get the proper one. It was just a longer wait time. So I think I had to wait 13 weeks for that bonnet. Totally worth it, because um, it is stunning um, and it's a little bit lighter than the other one. Not that much lighter. The factory aluminum bonnets are dumb light. Um, uh, the interior was obviously something that I never needed to hang on to. The, Front and rear seats were no use to me anymore because I was going to be putting bucket seats in. So as soon as they sold, I was able to buy the Sparco Circuit Twos, uh, which me as a 34 to 36 waist fit perfectly, nice and deep, uh, super comfortable chairs. Um, recommend them to anyone that um, yeah wants a full halo seat. Uh, thanks to Trident Motorsport for getting them in for me. Thanks to Trident also for getting in the uh, BMW parts. Um, letting me yeah, get them delivered to you guys. That was awesome. Uh, saved me from yeah, having delivered to my work. So once I had the control arm replaced, I was able to then uh, align the car a little bit. I had some temporary wheels on it just to get me going uh, to keep the car rolling around while I was waiting on the D-speeds. And um, managed to find radiators here in Perth. So I had to get and aux like the only radio that was still good was one of the auxiliary radiators. Um, I had to get the main radiator, I had to get the heat exchanger and the heat exchanger auxiliary radiator as well. Took the car for a drive just up and down the block just to see if it would um, yeah, drive because I haven't driven it besides from getting it off the trailer into the, into the shed. So uh, here's a video of uh, me driving the car for the first time on the road just up the street just to 
just to see how if it'd hold coolant and all that. So. Then I had to move on to getting other things sorted, so getting the actual front end on. Um, I ordered all the parts from BMW, as it was cheaper than buying all of them second hand, and there were really not many parts second hand, uh, especially on eBay. As I said, they were fairly expensive. So yeah, I managed to order all those parts for it. and. Um, uh, fitted them on they came out really well obviously factory BMW stuff that just fits straight on and um, yeah once the car was pretty much together I thought it was time to uh, take it for a shakedown so um, I managed to find some some other wheels that I had lying around to put some average tires on 265 semis but they're like eight years old uh, just something that I could get on the track with so I put them on and yeah, super stoked to have the car um, yeah, at the track for its first event uh, just, just to shake down. So stock seats, stock everything, um, a bonnet that was all bent and sort of bent back into shape as much as I could. And um, yeah, I managed to end up getting a 66.7 second lap around Monero Long Track. So. Uh, that was uh, pretty good for a shakedown the car. I had to burn off all the old fuel because I don't think it had been driven since 2021. So I was taking it easy for the first couple laps until it was pretty much empty. Um, yeah, so I ended up putting fresh fuel in, went for a good run, and that's where I got the 66.7. So not a bad shakedown. Um, definitely cool. I'd never actually been in one of these cars before that event. Like That was the first time I actually drove an F80. Uh, chassis, so uh, I've never even driven it. The only other M3 that I've ever driven is an E46 M3 um, SMG, and other than that, I've never driven any other ones. Um, so it was pretty cool to drive my first ever M4, um, M3 M4, uh, on the racetrack at full tilt, so it was really cool. Car went well, didn't leak anything, um, and I thought, this is great, the car's good. Um, now to move on, let's let's get the next step happening. So I uh, had a good chat with uh, my sponsor Dips, uh, who's looked after me with both the 34, the S15, S14, um, awesome blokes there. So they helped me out and we come up with an idea of what color we wanted to do on this new car. And I've always wanted another blue car. Uh, the 34 was Bayside Blue when I first got it. And when I saw these M4s and M3s, the San Marino Blue was probably my favorite color that I've ever seen on a car. So I asked them what's the closest they have to it and the Sapphire Blue was uh, was definitely the closest they had. And I think it's even better than San Marino Blue in my opinion. So love the color, uh, dropped it off to them and they got to work, make sure that it was all uh, painted uh, in a perfect blue uh, in the new Dips Evo. So. Thanks to them for painting that. And when I got it home, I finally was able to put my wheels on. So I was able to put my wheels on and I realized that the car was super high and that wasn't gonna fly. <laughs> I had to get um, I had to get coil overs for it and contacted a good friend who's, um, who's in with uh, Just Jap Racing and they hooked me up on a set of BCZR Racing coil overs um, thinking, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it right. I don't wanna spend yeah, seven hundred dollars less on a average set of coilovers. Considering what BMW would have spent on the original suspension design, I thought it was best to get the good stuff. So I went to the ZR coilovers with the external reservoirs. Um, I was a little bit cautious because I had no idea what they looked like because there were no photos of them online. So I didn't know what the BCZRs. Yeah, it looked like and where I'd need to route the external canister if the rim was going to touch the shock um, because I took a photo of the one with the factory suspension. I was like, Whoa, that's the most that I can get on the offset of the rim. I'd really hope that it's not going to hit the hit strut, which 
was very lucky uh, now that it's all together that it doesn't actually hit the strut, which was a saving grace. Um, so yeah, got it back from Dips and ordered the coilovers. Once we had them ordered and I test fitted the wheels and everything, uh, I needed to take the car to Frankie at uh, Not Scared Racing as we discussed um, building a wing for this. So I wanted an efficient wing that would meet all the regulations for the racing categories that uh, I'd have to do. Um, and also I wanted, I wanted a wing. I wanted it to be a boy racer car, so it needed to look cool. And he came up with a wicked design, uh, 1.7 meters wide uh, with the perfect 40 to one drag coefficient. So managed to get that sorted and um, he tested it and stood on it to show that, yep, it can handle downforce at uh, whatever speed you wanna go. So uh, we were gonna do bracing on the inside of the boot, but with the arms that come over the back, it actually pushes down into the, the boot itself. So the boot won't flex, it's actually a reinforced carbon plastic, so it's strong as, uh, and won't deform. So the wing looked sick, and I was super stoked with that. So when I got it back, um, by that time my bonnet had arrived, and yeah, that's when I decided to cut into it so then I got the car back from Frankie, and by that time I had my bonnet. So the carbon Seabon carbon bonnet from the US had finally arrived, and then it was time to cut into it. And that was a nerve-wracking experience to cut holes for the bonnet pins. I uh, went the aero aero catch latches. Uh, they are yeah super strong. They're good quality, and um, they look fantastic. So getting the right holes done right and all that thanks to Kia's Motorsport for doing a video on how to um, made it really helpful so I yeah got the got the carbon bonnet on and then it was time to yeah fit every, everything else so two days before my event on the Saturday I had my coilovers arrive my seats arrive and my headlights arrive so I had Thursday night and Friday night to install everything. So the headlights took most of Thursday um, and then I was able to get the seat bracket made, uh, but it was the harnesses that I was having a tr struggle with. The harness on the back, I couldn't find anywhere to mount it. So Friday I had to um, make a harness bar to actually mount the harnesses to. But I got the seat in uh, ready for the Saturday event Headlights were in, and then coilovers. Coilovers were fairly easy enough install, um, straightforward with any other coilover. Had to figure out where to actually put them. So I well, put the external canisters, uh, made a place for them at the uh, top strut brace, which seemed to be the best place for them for now. Um, don't think there's any actually other place you can put them because these engine bays are full of stuff. Um, yeah, so the car was pretty much ready to go uh, serviced, um, and serviced and ready. I was keen. I had the harnesses all set up. The car was looking fantastic with its wheels, tires, suspension, wing, paint. Oh, I was yeah over the moon with how it looked and I couldn't wait to share it with everyone. So take it, took it to the track for its tuning day and um, on the first session out, I could not believe how much grip the car had. It was on rails and the thing just turned and it, it went wherever you wanted it to go. Um, I had my phone on the dash for the time and I breezed in a 65 second lap and which was already taking a second off my original lap time uh, when I first took it to the track. And I thought, that is crazy. This car is definitely in the 63s today. So come back into pits after that session I had 45 pound in all four tires, so I was like, that's, <laughs> that's not what you want. I think people run them about 28. So I dropped them to 30 hot, uh, just to see what they'd do. And um, the next session out, I landed a 64.2 um, with yeah, better pressures in the tires, um, which, was, which was fantastic. Like it was super quick, car felt great. And, but I knew there was more in it. So I did a little bit of an alignment on the front because I think it was still towing in a bit. Um, and then yeah, I, I pushed the car a lot harder that time. I ended up getting the car down to a 62.9, which is 0 0.01 second off of the 34. And it 
like it's crazy the car is this car is just so quick for standard power standard downpipe standard exhaust not even panel filters are still running the factory panel filters so as far as the chassis goes it is a tight chassis and they are an incredible car dct feels great um yeah the car was was fantastic at the track and to be able to go flat stick on it, it's pretty much maiden voyage the first one i would say was this maiden voyage but this one now that it's finally actually um complete uh that was that was the best result to have um i did get a lot of fuel starving issues as well so when the car was around a third of a tank uh, it had actually misfire a bit and actually went into limp mode saying that um fuel reserve but i thought i've got a third of a tank more than more than a quarter and i didn't think that it would actually have that issue but um they don't seem to have fixed it from the 46s where the fuel sloshes so that's the next fix is to get a fuel um, siphon system from one side of the tank to the other just so that I can run it a little bit lower in fuel or at least not have to put 20 litres in every session that I go out so yeah that was good fun um, and then I took some spare tyres with me to go drifting afterwards but um, not realising that um, my tyres on the Commodore were already bold I wasn't able to run two pairs of tyres and had one pair but still got a couple of laps in had a super good time throwing the car around and drifting it. Um, it handles great, it's just uh, a little bit of a challenge being DCT automatic, it doesn't actually have a clutch pedal and I didn't feel confident enough pulling the handbrake because I don't really want to brake the car yet if the DCT doesn't allow me to use it. So next time I'll try the handbrake just to see if it'll what it'll do. Uh, from the looks of things online, you can use the handbrake, um, but I don't know how it's gonna feel. So. Yeah, hope you enjoy this video about the story about the car. Um, there's so much gonna be happening to it. Um, I'm gonna continue with chassis modifications and reliability modifications before going power. Um, I'll definitely go power next year. I'll get downpipes and exhaust uh, and a tune and panel filters to, um, to bring that power up uh, a little bit, probably about 10, 15%. So yeah, excited for where this thing's gonna take me. Um, yeah, I can't get over how, how awesome it looks and how cool it is, but it's my first turbo BMW. That's a hell of a race car. Stay tuned.